Thank you very much. So, hi everyone. Welcome to our panel discussion, science and science communication. Knowledge is not enough. And you've got that emphatic question mark and exclamation mark for a reason. We'll get back to that. This event is streamed live. So I also want to extend a warm welcome to our online audience. And I want them to know, you know that, of course, but they don't, possibly, that this is a joint event of two Circle U summer schools. One is focused on climate communication and the other on sustainability. Obviously, representation and communication play a key role on both our agendas. And we do ask similar questions. How to communicate what the climate crisis is and what it means, but also how to convince individuals, institutions, and societies of the urgent need for a radical change. So today's topic is highly relevant for both our schools. So by way of an introduction, I want to say that our subtitle highlights a conundrum. If all the facts about the climate crisis are on the table, why are we, as a society, as an institution, as an individual, unable to match the urgency of this crisis with decisive and prompt action. In order to get closer to an answer to this question, we have to first ask if it is indeed true that knowledge about the climate crisis is widely available. But we also need to talk about forms of representation. Does it come in forms that can be properly taken in by a broader public? And we will talk about what else is needed in climate communication and think about our own aims in communication. What is it that we want to achieve? Is communication simply about conveying facts or do we really want to start a process that enables people to become agents of change? To discuss these and other questions, we have invited a number of experts in the field of climate politics and climate communication. In different ways, all of our panelists are engaged in representing climate change and in rendering this crisis intelligible. We do count ourselves lucky to have you here to engage with each other, but also with us. And I'd like to first engage in a discussion with our panelists, but please write down any questions that you might have, because we will open the discussion later so that you can directly engage with them. Let me introduce you in alphabetical order. So we have Professor Nathalie Blanc from the Center of Earth Politics in Paris, who approaches climate change from a social, aesthetic, and experiential perspective. And I do hope that's an adequate description. We have Professor Klaus Eisenach, who has developed a game that renders climate politics tangible. And we have Vero Pinska from the Sustainability Office at HAU, a student initiative that is engaged in the process of transforming Humboldt University. And we have Zara Schumann, who has published widely on climate issues from a journalistic perspective. Vero, I did warn you, the first question goes to you. And that's by way of recognizing that it's been students all along who have been pushing the agenda of climate crisis and of sustainability. Um, and you are a member of the Sustainability Office at the HAU. Many of us have already met you. And what I would like to know is, in trying to transform Humboldt University, is communication of knowledge, of facts, the main thing that you need to do? Or are you engaged in other ways with that kind of change? So is it really about communicating facts, or isn't it? OK, um, does that work? For first, yeah, okay, perfect. Um, the, the most diplomatic answer is always, yeah, we need both of it. <laughs> uh, and I hope that I can say that we all have this image of this, like that we know that we are in a certain crisis and that it is clear for everyone, at least at the Humboldt University, so that I don't have to explain it to anyone. So. At least I, I think this uh, knowledge is already there. What we maybe are missing, or what the mission of the university should be, is that the students, when they go out of the university, have enough uh, instruments to tackle the crisis, to know my field, or I'm expert in something. I, got, I studied this subject, and now I can use these instruments that I learned to 
tackle or uh, to also go against this frightening crisis that for our you know, our generation creates a, a real frightening moment because we just hear about dystopias and don't know how to act and how to go further and I think in communication in communicating um, climate knowledge first we have to learn how to use the instruments but then also as a university show that we are prepared to transform our world and that we want to do that so in one sense by teaching and the other sense also visually the Humboldt University should show also outside of the university that we want to change something thank you very much for this so I hear you and I think one of your key points is that facts are just a point of departure, but then we need to sort of move elsewhere or move on. Thank you very much. Natalie, you're the director of the Earth Politics Center in Paris, um, which was established in 2019 as a collaboration between the University of Paris and the Sciences Po. And the idea is, as I understand it, to fashion a space for collaborative research that brings together the natural sciences with the human and social sciences. After all, and that's the idea, we're looking at an emergency that concerns all aspects of human life. So what is it that the Earth Politics Center does and how can it contribute or how does it contribute to rendering climate change intelligible? Yes, thank you for inviting me first. I mean, this issue of bringing together natural sciences and social and humanities is a, a very, very uh, urgent thing to do. And that's what we do, we're doing at the Earth Politics Center. I mean, for example, we have this campus, Anthropocene, we call it the Anthropocene campus, where we bring together all people, all players, stakeholders, from different places and try to make them see the issues in a, com in a collective way uh, at the scale of uh, a waterway or at the scale of a region or so. So that's one thing we're doing, trying to uh, mesh together the knowledge of different people and also engage with uh, civil society. But one thing I wanted to say in a rebound from uh, what uh, Ver Veron Vero was saying just before, is I have been studying this issue of science on one side and um, how do you, would you say, would you would say sensible knowledge or aesthetic knowledge as I call it, and you find that often that among people from a whatever society, people don't refer to science to acknowledge the environment. For example, we have been working on pollution issues, which are very abstract issue, and even people who are sick from pollution don't go on internet for science. I mean, they don't try to check uh, what is the quality of air today in order to know if they can go out. What they do is they feel what is good for them today or not. For example, they look at the sky and say it's black or they taste the air with their tongue and say it stinks, or they look at the walls of their building and they say it's black, so it's polluted, or they take the cotton pad at the end of the day and say, see, it's black on my, on my skin. So they use all, we, we, we can say, aesthetics indicator uh, in order to describe what is the problem. It's why uh, knowledge, depends how you talk of knowledge. If you talk about scientific knowledge, no, it is not enough just to uh, go further in terms of not only communication, but making people feel what is at stake. So, yeah. Thank you very much. You're reminding us that there are different forms of knowledge and that there is such a thing as embodied experience, right? Thanks a lot. Frau Schumann. You're a well-known voice in Germany in matters of climate. You're a member of the Climate Network of German-speaking journalists, and you co-authored their climate charter. And just this year, and I'll hold it up, you published a truly eye-opening book called Klartext Klima. It just appeared in March, and it's in German, so people here will not know it, I'm afraid. So maybe you tell us, why did you write this book, and what does it try to achieve? 
What I'm trying to do for about two years now is um, trying to tell my colleagues that we are not really taking the climate crisis seriously, at least not as serious as it is, but as serious as we think it is. And um, what I was doing for about two years now was trying to explain the structural problems we are facing in the journalism sphere and how we could solve this and so on. And then um, I am invited for speeches and so on and I'm giving a lot of interviews and stuff and everybody then is nodding and it's like yeah it's, it's right okay we should do really more about climate and then I just realized that they're going home to their desks and they don't do anything and um, I'm pretty much convinced that um, that would change if we would um, have a more or a, a better knowledge about the connections in the climate crisis because yeah we all agree that climate change is bad and we can all not yeah uh, say that it's not getting hotter because we can feel it and stuff like this but um, I think that there isn't enough of basic knowledge about all the interconnections that we face um, about uh, the timelines that we are uh, facing and stuff like this so I was trying to write a book to explain all this um, like the most most important uh, points and connections with not so many um, numbers and stuff and uh, also connect these um, facts and connections to a more personal approach. So I'm really open in this book and also normally in my communication about um, that also me as now a climate journalist, um, I didn't really understand how severe this crisis is till two years ago. And um, that was really surprising for myself because um, at this point I was reading about the climate crisis for about two years every day. And I was reading a lot of books and seeing a lot of documentaries and still thinking that it doesn't really have to do so much with my life. It's more like about the global south and then maybe my grandchildren. And then there came one day in uh, 2020 when I just realized, oh, this is not true. And it's also not like we have 30 years to solve all this, but we have to do it now and we have to do the main steps till the end of this decade. And this were all things I had read a lot of times and um, where I had heard a lot of uh, interviews with scientists and stuff like this, but I didn't really get what it means. And um, to really transfer this and make this understandable, it needs much more than facts, but like facts and connections are a very good base. Thank you very much. So knowing is not knowing, or there are different sort of levels of knowing. That's what I took away from your book as well. And you had three terms that yeah. made this very clear. Do you want to? Yeah, I can um, introduce this. So um, when I became aware of the climate crisis, like maybe the first thing I did was talk to psychologists because I just realized, okay, it has so much to do with psychology, uh, why we don't act and stuff like this. And the um, psychological model is a more nuanced one, but I developed one that is more, I think, um, easy to apply on things. And that's more like we do have some different levels of awareness concerning the climate crisis. And um, the first one is um, kind of climate change. So yeah, we all agree it's really bad, no, 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 but it's also kind of far away. And maybe we're going to have some good surprise as well. Um, could be. And um, then there's the another one, the one that I have been like the two years where I was reading on it every day. It was like, Okay, the climate crisis, it's really severe and we really should do something and I stopped flying and I tried to improve my whole private life but I still was thinking that I don't really have to do something about it in my professional life and I wasn't really writing about it in journalism because um, I even thought, okay, this is some kind of my interest so I as a journalist can't really write about something that is important to me, this kind of a journalistic rule and um, this is really absurd that I thought that climate change is some of my interest and then just um, there is the uh, awareness level of climate catastrophe. So you know what the climate catastrophe is and what it has to do with your life and that we don't have uh, so much time, if any, to really prevent it. And um, this is also really important when you think about communication because um, there might just make one jump further. Um, I do think that the um, idea of positive climate communication, which is really um, known in the climate communication field, doesn't really work because it just works for the climate catastrophe guys. Because they might be 
uh, can't move and stuff like this, and they could be motivated by solutions, but everybody else will just hear, ah, there are solutions, so someone will impl implement them. And we have time till 2050, so okay, no, don't, don't worry, right? And um, so this is one of my theories. Thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, Eisenach, you're head of resource economics at the HU, and adaptation to climate change features among your research interests, but also gaming and simulation. And you even developed, as I mentioned earlier, your own climate game. Now, in your teaching, you must be concerned with communicating knowledge about climate change. And as a fellow educator, I wonder about whether your teaching experience played a part in the idea to develop this board game. And I think we want to hear a bit more about it. How does it work and what does it do for climate communication? Okay, these are many questions. <laughs> um, since we are, te I'm teaching in a, co in a program called Integrated Natural Resource Management, so these whole topics are core of in the program what we are talking about here um, today. Uh, and one thing that I try to convey in the beginning of the program to the students, and maybe it's a tall order to say this, but I say, okay, now we have those 40 years of solutions and knowledge. So we have the technologies. So when I started developing the game about 15 years ago, and when I started to do economic research about climate change, I started from the premise, we know the natural science facts. Of course, there are improvements and details, yeah, but the basic facts are known. The technology options were on the table. Of course, there are still improvements, but the basic options were on the table. Um, at this time, we thought, okay, we need to improve the policy instruments to make this real. And now, 15 years later, you see what happens. Yeah? So what I then tried to say in the beginning is we need to be smarter than the people so far, because they were not able to bring this knowledge into real action. Yeah? And of course, a single person <laughs> cannot do this uh, all alone, and we need to try out different new approaches, new ideas, new methods, and also maybe new ways of communication as one component in the whole story, yeah, uh, to bring it further. Um, and basically, this is partially enshrined in the game. So I said it's, it's, it was made under the premise that the basics are there, but the question is how to act. Um, so the game, um, it looks like this here. It's a real board game. Now there comes the advertisement part here. Yeah, you play on a play on a world map, different countries, and the game mechanics gives you a very simple climate model and an economic model. But then you can start negotiate and invent new additional rules or agreements to solve or not solve the thing. The good thing in a game is if you fail, the world is not broken. It's just the game that is, has been failed. And sometimes this game brings about very creative ideas. Um, but of course, I don't believe that this is a silver bullet that solves these kind of, these kind of uh, problems. What, what um, research, our research, and also other people research on, on, on using games for communication uh, shows is, and that resonates what you have said before, is that games are not so good at teaching declarative knowledge, so knowing the basic facts. It's also not bad, it's just as other conventional methods, so there's not a huge difference. What where games can make a difference is when it comes to seeing a more cold kind of picture or getting emotionally involved. And then you might get a new, new drive maybe to act, possibly to act. Um, uh, but what this research also shows, it depends on the people who use and facilitate the game. So it's not only the thing itself. It's, it's a social process around this, that matter. And since this is very important when we want to do science communication beyond conveying declarative knowledge in a conveyor belt-like model. And I think we need to go beyond this. We need to consider the ethical, uh, the societal, um, and um, also the emotional components yeah, of, 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 of the, that are attached to, uh, to what is happening in the real world. Like we feel that it's hot and not only know from the literature that it will become hot, yeah, as you were saying. 
Yeah, thank you very much. So what I'm taking away is that we definitely need more than facts in communicating knowledge and that we need to include the emotions and I want to sort of check this and um, keep it in mind, but sort of address first, briefly at least, the question, um, are we, is enough knowledge being communicated? Are the media doing enough? Are universities doing enough in communicating climate science? Before we get to the question, is knowledge itself enough? So do we have enough knowledge? Is it, is it really available to everyone? And that's, I think, a question for anyone who wants it. Bureau. Maybe I start from the student's perspective. And since I was now in the summer school and I have uh, I work in a workshop and we're talking about education and for a research assignment, the students sent to me from five different universities all the courses that in some way um, have to do with sustainability. And mainly it were the fields or the subjects of ecology, of course, uh, hydro hydrology, geography, all these natural sciences. If it comes to social sciences, it gets even like the, the, um, all the courses diminish all the time through it. And in the at Humboldt University, we see it also a lot. Um, we've got, we created a program, it's called Studium Ecologicum, and it's uh, made from two parts. The first is a serious lecture uh, or lecture series um, organized by students, and the second part is uh, another course that you can choose um, within the wide range of other courses in the, uh, at the universities. And my job at the university is to look for these courses. In the last two years, yes, they were getting more, but at least I can say for every institute, there are about two courses, two courses for every institute, and this un university that has 40,000 people in it, I think it's not enough. And that only geographers have climate science, is, it's not even enough. So we have this, as we already said, we have this basics. We know it's getting hotter, we can feel some change, but I think at least this interconnectedness, and this interconnectedness, what is really important, the social uh, part that it has to be taken, the social part that can uh, develop how we move, how we act, um, not we as single people, but we are a society. That's something where research, maybe it's not missing, but it's not um, provided to other students. And other students maybe are not motivated to get also into those fields. Maybe there is some kind of um, self-esteem that, that is lacking. Like, like you said, yeah, maybe it's because I'm interested in it and so my colleagues do not have to do it. But I think our professors have to talk to their colleagues and say, uh, you're, you're teaching microbiology. Why aren't you not given a co giving a course? And in the first lesson, talk about climate change. There was a program once, it was pretty interesting, from the uh, Scientists for Future. One scientist just came up with the idea and said, okay, why don't we have uh, one presentation with 10 slides with the main important facts on climate change? And every and we sent this course, this, the slides, to every professor at, in Germany, and everyone can choose if he would show in the first lecture, just showing the slides and and just talking through with his own knowledge, because I think the the most common facts everyone can teach them, and just show them, and. They, I don't know if they're still doing it, because then with the pandemics, maybe it, it was not easy then to follow up. But the idea that we just start every lecture in any university with this argument, it's very important to at least show that everyone can teach climate science, everyone can uh, learn climate science, and everyone can research with a question that tackles climate science. And I think that is very important for universities to start, and there has not been as going on enough in the last years. Uh, I would like to, to underline the fact that uh, social sciences and humanities have not been involved enough in climate science. I mean, it's like there are a lot of facts and often uh, natural sciences are very well funded on the subject, but not so much uh, political science, for example, or not so much human geography or humanities, because what we need to learn is how to change. 
and we don't know how to change right now. We have the facts we could say about climate, but how do we change? And we don't know how to tackle this issue because in the history, I mean, when I think about the book of Graeber, David Graeber, for example, I mean, he shows wonderful examples through history of civilization who have been grasping this idea of change, of auto-organization, of self-organization and stuff like that. But we don't know how to change from the state of our society to tomorrow. I mean, uh, and even when we talk about transition, socio-ecological transition, the more often it's about technical transition, economic transition. It's not so much about political transition and how it, it, we can move from one state to the other. So the Center for Earth Politics is driven by social sciences and humanities, and we work uh, a lot with natural sciences about the habitability of the Earth, or livability of the Earth, and trying to see how this question mingles uh, art facts, uh, as we could call them, like natural sciences facts, with uh, creativity facts, political, political facts, and all kind of facts, how we can uh, depart from a territory, a specific territory, specific land, and see all of us together how we can change and what does it mean to change together. And that's something that social sciences and humanities should uh, be brought, uh, should be able to bring up on the table more and more. I would like to object a bit to what you were saying. Um, because I think what, what science as a whole body of scientific communities knows, it's a lot. There might be a bias towards the natural sciences, but uh, econ economics jumped on this quite early. And when you look how the IPCC reports developed over the last rounds, you have a steadily increase of uh, scholars of law, philosophy, psychology, sociology, and so on. So it's really broadening in geography as well. They also jumped on it quite early. Um, of course, there's still a lot to be added, and there's something added every day, and maybe we can reshuffle the, the balance between those fields. But I think it's not that we, we can't say science, social science does not know enough that we need to act now. I think we have all, it's all there, but maybe it's a matter who has it available, where is it? Of course, if it's in scientific journals spread over different disciplines that don't talk to each other, then it's societally not available. So it m might also matter whom to convey which kind of knowledge. And then we are in the communication field here. And what are the appropriate format to reach different types of uh, people here? But I would say it's there. There's one thing, maybe that is what your statement was about, where I think knowledge is not far enough uh, in science. Um, I hear many people from engineering, but also from social sciences say, OK, we know everything, but there is an implementation gap. So it's not our problem as science. It's a problem of practice to implement stuff. And I would say, as scientists, we have a knowledge gap about implementation. We need to know how to implement plans, actions, and strategies in a better way than we did the last 40 years. And maybe that is what you're referring to. Yeah. So maybe I'm closing, and I can tell you where the knowledge is not, and this is in lots of editorial teams. Um, this is kind of mean, but it also connects to what Vero just said. Um, I was studying here about 10 years ago, and I didn't learn a bit about climate science and about climate change and how this is all going together and affect, no, no, no. So this is also kind of unfair that I do criticize all my colleagues now all the time, but because where should they have it from? And um, Still, this is no excuse. We're journalists. We do have a responsibility, and we have to see what we don't know, and we have to find ways to um, yeah, manage this knowledge in our editorial teams and to grow it. And um, I really thought a long time about what do you really have to know to understand how urgent the situation is. And for me, it's really the combination of um, people have to understand what their CO2 budget is, uh, what the effects of 1.5 and 2 degrees are, 
like concretely and where's the difference and also what are tipping points and if you just like once try to understand how all this belongs together you're really like flabbergasted why we are not all trying to change everything from now on and um, I think um, this is also the same um, in many other expert fields so many people are like oh we have till 2050 years so it's 30 years of time so okay someone will get it started right and then I'm gonna go and uh, jump in and um, I think the urgency is not understood there is some kind of um, emotional knowledge about the climate crisis and yeah that makes us feel uncomfortable and uh, and I don't know but I think if you really know how severe the crisis is it's just the most rational and it's also the most selfish thing to just promote really climate action and um, it's also the most uh, solidaric thing you can do and um, so I think also that universities do play a role in getting this started and to show all these interconnections because one thing I try to um, teach to my colleagues is that climate change isn't an issue but it's a, 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 a dimension of every issue so um, every journalist should think about where are the interconnections how does my issue affect climate change and how does climate change affect my issue and um, this is also something that should be teach at the university but this is not enough anymore because we can't wait for you all to get into the uh, uh, big uh, boss positions it's also that in the editorial teams now we have to get this knowledge um, spread yeah in um, in the Berlin University Alliance we have that um, we have the grand challenges that we need to address and I think you know from what you're saying the climate emergency is perhaps the grand grandest of grand challenges yeah and no one can really afford to ignore it anymore but I do think people still do and also people at university. I'm completely with Vero there, you know. Um, there are still a lot of people who think that this is just one other topic amongst many others and who do not recognize the existential threat that this situation poses, right? And I also think it's very important to keep in mind what um, the two of you just said, you know, there, is, there are the facts and they're not yet available to everyone, but they are out there somehow on the table. But then there's the knowledge about implementation. What kind of policies do we need? How do we implement them? And we had a very interesting keynote lecture from Ivan Engelbritsen from Oslo. Um, and his point was that we need to recognize that this is also a political process. So it's not just a technical question, but it's also a political question. What kind of policies do we want to implement, what can we implement? That poses lots of ethical questions as well, of course. So thank you very much. Um, I think we agree that we need a bit more knowledge out there, but that's not all. You also said in your introductory statements that we may need more than facts, and can we talk a little bit about that? So if you want, I do have a few ideas, but I'd like to hear from you, what do you think, what is missing? What else do we need apart from facts? In that, in that attempt to communicate to people, not just the climate crisis, but also the urgency of the situation? I just wanted to add uh, uh, an issue, the issue of inequalities. I mean, and uh, the issue of the public we're talking to. I mean, it's like we're talking to many, 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 many people all don't feel they have the freedom to address this issue of climate change for whatever reason, I mean, belongs to them. So it's not uh, as, I mean, I, I feel for many people and many students, the main issue of climate, cri the climate crisis is not climate <coughs> itself, it's inequalities. And we can't grasp the climate crisis without delving into the issue of inequalities first. Uh, so I don't know how we talk to people who are who don't have enough to to, to live on. For example, yesterday uh, our president, the French president, said that uh, we should give up on the era of ab abundance. Uh, but uh, some people said, well, we have never known that, that era. So this was a big mistake of communication from his part because he doesn't know about it even. So, but what I meant to say is, is we can't 
have the same bare facts delivered to whoever is listening to this uh, climate uh, crisis. And I think that we don't know yet how to address this issue of inequalities in terms of uh, tackling with the climate crisis. Maybe I would like to object that I don't think we have to touch the inequalities first because we don't have any time left for any first, but we have to tackle everything at the same time. And I also do think that um, getting the urgency communicated really changes our views about what are feasible solutions and what are not. So um, for a long time I thought, okay, like every solutions I hear, yeah, sounds fantastic, no, 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 but it's also like an utopia and it won't be possible. And um, just in the minute I understood how urgent this crisis is. I just understood, ah, these are no utopian ideas and like having um, an equal um, distribution of whatever will be crucial and absolutely existential to make us uh, sustain these societies because if not, we're going just to fight for resources and stuff like this. And uh, we also have to make all this um, doable for a lot of people. As you said, many people can't afford to even think about all this. And so um, I think we would have to tackle this in, uh, yeah, in the meantime. And um, for the question what we think is important, um, Normally I, see, uh, I say emotions, but we already talked about this. And I would say uh, connections. Um, I was teaching uh, about um, the journalistic possibility of um, uh, climate communication here before, and the um, participants me, uh, just told me that um, the climate school was, uh, the, the summer school was fa uh, focusing on individual change. Um, in behavior change and stuff like this. And I think this is no good focus because we should more focus on how individuals can change systems, and they can because we are our citizens and we all do have bigger levels. And um, also just focusing on individual change uh, might just make us all feel bad and not face this at all. But um, showing how all the interconnections are and showing how you can get active and really change something in your your community and thus change the norms and values in the society and thus make politics possible that make this change possible for everyone is really, really important and also really empowering for people. Yeah, what do we need? So, of course, we need to have uh, get the motivation to think deeper into this and also those people that do very little about climate change that they have a motivation is worth thinking about this, what we can do. I think this is obvious, and this communication might help here. Um, and I completely agree with what you're saying. So when we want to deal with climate change, it's not only about changing individual behavior. We need to change the societal institutions we have, in a way. And if communication works, it helps us to um, think about or develop strategies how to do this. Yeah, and But this is a that we, that's not only teaching the facts, this is about having a discourse about which strategies could work uh, in these in this challenges. And a, a third and last one I want to mention, and here I'm now skeptical in the last years. If you have asked me three years ago, I would say we need to have optimism. <laughs> yeah, Because if you are not optimistic, you become a fatalist and you do nothing you learn nothing, you do not act, then you're failing on all these different uh, respects. Um, actually, now we experience climate change in, in Europe in an obvious way, individually. Um, we are just in the process with this game, so that was when we designed the game, we started with the situation 1990, and we now have a project here running with the Humboldt Forum of, of updating it to a starting year 2020, and with all our testing games, you fail. So, okay, this is just maybe a bad game design, you might say, but it's an anecdote that tells what we think about, possibly. So, is op can we really be optimistic, or are we naive if we are optimistic, but if we are, but fatalism is not the answer. So, what could then be the right attitude to approach this? I have no answer to this, but I think this is an important thing we need to discuss about what could be mindsets or frames that bring us further, whether this is um, courage or despair or, or um, 
yeah, some other kinds of feelings we can at least abstractly or analytically attach to what we are doing here. I would spontaneously call it uh, radically realist, I think, because uh, we have to face that we're really, really, really deep into this crisis, and we destroyed a lot, and there are a lot of things we can't fix anymore, but it's also a really realistic view that we can still change so much and preserve so much, and I think this is a um, good part to start from and just, yeah, also take much power from it, maybe. go ahead. I, I just waited. I thought maybe um, the people who have more experience in life can uh, teach me something. Um, but no. <laughs> <laughs> yes, of course, importantly. But something that I sometimes miss is, uh, or what I would say, uh, what you like said, okay, now where are we now? at least in history or some anecdotes of the grandma or something always says like if you're really at the bottom of something you have to get creative and then you can evolve new ideas and get out of something and I was thinking like maybe also you can answer just nodding or something when you started university when you started in your 20s did you know where to go in life did you know what will happen? Did you know I will get the scientist? I will write a book about I don't think so. And I was like, OK, I think all of you, maybe you can also say, who does not know what to do after the university? Yeah, just for the public online, it's more than the half of the people. So I think we all have to get creative after our universitarian career, like we do our bachelors and masters, maybe. And when we start acting, we have to be aware in which world we are standing. On the one side, we have to know what has been destroyed and what we can save. And on the other side, we have to also, I, I think sometimes this, this mourning has never been, like we have to acknowledge some things will never get back. And it's okay, we will go on living. Otherwise the other dis option would be, we, yeah. Uh, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to call it, but we want to live, and we want to live in a life, we want to live together, and I think if we all start thinking, out of all of you, how can we change something, and then importantly, don't think just how uh, we can engage in society or do something, but we have to think it bigger, we have to think how can we change as a society, and we here as a university are the people that learn to think through it and learn to think. I, I was in a <laughs> workshop also two days ago from Wendy Morrell, and she was talking about uh, system thinking. We have to start to think in systems and analyze them with different views. Like all of us, we learn different methods and also you, you have different views and we have to work together to find out some solution, maybe for small things, for bigger things, and then also <laughs> encourage ourselves to go to decision-making people and really go there and propose these ideas. To make an example, um, I have to choose which one I would wanted to say. Um, yeah, maybe this, as a, as a student's un, um, initiative, uh, we won a prize from the French, and uh, we were like, it was a, a prize from, um, it was called Europe, um, Utopia Europe. And we had to think about one project for the EU Union that can change something. And we were like sitting for, for hours and hours discussing. And then there was the solution for us. Um, we called it the recovery position for climate. That would be like, you know, all the different companies where there are working enough of people, they have to have someone who has a um, uh, first aid course. And we said, why? Hasn't, like, why does there not exist a first aid for climate? Because it's now we have, to, we need this necessary I instruments. All of us do need them. And so maybe we here are at the point where we have to create these instruments and then through communication, give them to all of them. And then maybe we can also arrive to the global south, which where it is all most needed because um, not bring it, but at least also recognize which um, threat, like how much economically the North has um, really destroyed the South, I'll say. So 
maybe with kind of these metaphors, if we start thinking on really on how we can change. And also, I think it's important also to say, I, I have no idea, and sit for a long time, and believe in yourself, and think. Then you can come up with great ideas together. I can just empower you to do that, because we need all of you. All of you here, all of your people at the universities, your professors, and yeah, just just to get a more empowering view, maybe, after your despair, which I can absolutely share. But I'm, I'm an optimist still. And <laughs> 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 when, what we see. Well, I'm sure there's a dangerous kind of optimism and a productive kind of optimism, and the latter is yours. So um, let me try and gather a few strands here. So we agree that um, emotions are important. We agree that connections are important, we agree that collective um, action is important, and we agree that we need new instruments. Um, but I want to return sort of very briefly to the question of what are we actually communicating? Is it facts, or are we also trying to teach competencies? Are we just offering problems, or are we also trying to provide, maybe not solutions, but ways of getting engaged? So how do we get from kind of the facts to something that starts a process? I was wondering, uh, from what point of view are you asking this question? Oh, uh, sorry, I will speak uh, nearer the microphone. Yeah, uh, from what point of view? Is that from a professor point of view? For example, when I work with collective on the field, I mean, I do a lot of field work. They have their own uh, narrative of climate change. They don't read so much science. Uh, they don't need so much science. They have their own idea of how to act and respond to this emergency crisis. Uh, also, because the inequality issue brings that to, they have to adapt to all kind of uh, climate change issue, and they are not able to negotiate. I mean, they don't have to mitigate. They can't reduce their own emission of uh, uh, gas because they don't emit any. They don't have any money to emit any, so they just adapt. And in fact, uh, they don't need science to tell them how to adapt because they're collectively linked on, in small communities and trying to understand with their own means how to adapt to climate change. For example, they saw during the epidemics that they need to grow their own food. And is that some things we can teach them? What kind of a tool we need to give them in order for them to grow their own food? And so I would reverse the question somehow. I would say, what kind of uh, facts and competency do we observe that people need when we go out doing field work? Not what we think that we need to convey, because often, like we uh, kind of middle class people, not you know, having to adapt too much, and like we have enough money to get our own food. We're not, uh, we're not thinking, as Macron did yesterday, we're not thinking of the fact that most people just have to adapt to, I mean, poor solutions just uh, uh, for, for living. So I, I think we do, we do need to do field works and to see what kind of competencies, facts, and, uh, and ways of implementing this climate change adaptation ways we need. I don't know if it was clear. I hope so. Very much so, I think. And I think you raised a very important point. So I was asking from the point of view of half of our audience, the Climate Communication School, because I'm assuming people are here because they're interested in this topic and might do something in that field, perhaps after they graduate. But I think your point is extremely valid. So maybe it's not just about sort of feeding people facts, but about seeing where those people stand, where communities stand, listen, you know, and interact with them, not in a we teach you something way, but in a what does your life look like way, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. 
I would definitely agree that science communication is more than teaching facts. I think that's sure, but I think it's, I'm not a communication scholar, but I think it's a common place that communication needs to be tailored to the audience and the people you interact with. And um, so science communication, when you are in a, in a say, a governmental um, uh, counseling body or so, it's different than here or, in, or in, the, in the newspaper or in all the other different fora where science is communicated. And I think that's, so it's not the one and only way to, to, to do this. Um, I would also be careful with saying that uh, conveying emotions is important that can be easily misunderstood. Um, so I think it's important that it's not just that you know things as abstract thing, but you see that things that you're knowing are relating to what matters for you or people, or that you, have, that, that you feel maybe responsible to use your skills for certain purposes. So these are, of course, kind of emotions. Uh, but it, I think replacing science by emotions, that I just think because I feel it's like this, then you open the door for, for all these um, um, alternative facts approaches. So it's really, I think we need to be careful when we talk that we need to teach emotions here. Yeah? Um, I think we need to um, uh, teach uh, commitment, ethical standards, way maybe to analyze your emotions so that you can um, deal with them or convey them in different ways depending on whom you're talking to. Right? Um, so this is why I'm also skeptical where I say, okay, we just need to have more teaching on climate at universities. Maybe that's fine, okay, yeah. Um, but it is of no help if people who are talking or with decision makers or are decision makers elected or dictators or whatever, uh, if, if those people don't speak about climate change. This is important and of course this is more difficult to achieve. Yeah? That is why I find your project here quite interesting. That is one, maybe one with, with journalists. That is one important leverage point to get beyond the one-to-one -one discussion on the kitchen table. So I want to open the discussion very soon. But now that you know this, you have time to think, and I have time for a last question or problem that I'd like to address. And that's the relation between science and activism. And I think, in a sense, your comment um, already went into that direction. So the traditional role of the scientist and researcher is one of neutrality, scientific detachment, objectivity. Stand back, give people the facts, but don't get too invested. And it sounds a bit as if that was also the stance of a journalist. So do you think it's time to cross that line between science slash journalism and activism? Or is that a dangerous thing in itself? Maybe I can start, because I'm having this discussion a lot in journalism, and it's really exactly the same. And um, uh, it might be counterintuitive, because if you know what I'm saying normally, you would say that I'm absolutely for activism, because I'm always really, um, yeah, I don't know, clear. But uh, no, I would say we shouldn't cross the line, um, but we don't have to. So what um, is the same for journalism and science is that we don't tell people what they have to do, but we tell people what they are making um, choices between and which are the uh, possibilities and which are the ways. And while doing so, we um, in journalism have to be much more clear where is the um, scientific uh, consensus and which are just like uh, opinions and we have to be more clear about that and we have to more be more clear about, okay, what is the timeline here? How much time do we have? What is the alternative? So like if we don't do and change things, what will, be, will we be facing? And this might also be um, a parallel for uh, scientists, because as I said, I'm uh, talking to a lot of scientists uh, in the last few years about positive climate communication, which I really do think is a problem, as I already said. And people are really surprised then, because it was uh, kind of the thing for some years, like, okay, no, uh, we're just talking about solutions and stuff. And I'm really convinced that um, on, yeah, a really clear and honest um, communication that shows all the ways out, because that's really important and it's absolutely central, but also shows um, how few time is left for this and stuff like this, and uh, which is also really direct um, on 
people making bad decisions now and stuff like this. And um, before the election last year in Germany, I was uh, trying to explain like how important this election is and that the government we do have now is the last one that is able to maybe um, put into uh, uh, effect the measures that might um, lead us to uh, um, fulfill our fair share on 1.5 degree. Da, na, na. Um, and I was really trying to explain this, and none of my colleagues really took this. So there are just a few articles who even really explained how the connections are. And I was really frustrated. And then I was going to a lot of uh, climate scientists, and we're like, OK, did I get it wrong? So why is nobody picking this up? So why is nobody telling this? And they went, no, no, you're right. Said, OK, so maybe you want to make like a press conference or something so, and explain just the facts. And the scientists were always like, no, this is political. We can't explain it. And I was like, OK, but you shouldn't tell anyone to vote for anyone because you can't even because the Greens don't even have a program that is appropriate. So you just should explain how uh, important this um, election is and where um, we are standing and stuff like this. And there is a misunderstanding about what is political and what is activist and what is just being clear about the facts. Okay, it's burning inside of me because I have to object um, a bit. Um, uh, on some points I agree, on others I think journalism is really decide, like they can decide on what they're writing. And when they write about, or also science about activism, is so one sided. They are all, I think they're never doing a clear neutral position and write about something that happens. Neither on, like if you, for example, two and a half weeks ago, there was a climate camp in Hamburg. It was, it has two, it had two purposes. On the one side, they did a civil disobedience and a climate action in the city, but it was a huge camp. I was there also, I got, went to many workshops, I got informed, there were uh, very informal ways of learning, and it was focused on a decolonial, decolonial perspective. It means that there were two times panels and also uh, a press conference with about five um, activists from South America. Four of them could live now in Germany because they cannot live there anymore because uh, yeah, it would have been too dangerous for them. One person directly from there uh, that came to explain how they are endangered for their lives. So, and they were talking and they were talking to us and they were, were just communicating and the journalists didn't write about it. Maybe some s small, small articles, it was really just a small action. And I think also this, this, this f f it's, it's just because politicians are afraid of activists. Also journalists cannot write about them. Why not? Why are they afraid? Normally, is that a job of journalists also to go deeper in something and show also that there's a different perspective in it? I, I, don't, I know activism can also frighten uh, and, and has also very scary sides for political systems, uh, or even if they get more radical, and that's clear. But just don't talk about it. And do not writing and not speaking about it cannot help. And I also, I really appreciated the discussions of the scientists for future, because there they started and some uh, professors said, yeah, we have to do that. Others said, we don't have to do that. But then there was an individual decision of the profs or of the scientists. I go there or I'm not, or I'm not going there. And in the journalists, I just missed that a bit. Like, just if it activists are bad people or something. No, they work, they have a normal job, they do, they do study, they are normal people. But on the other side, maybe they fight for their justice in different, in different, um, yeah, in different relations, like or in um, uh, activity groups, like with Extinction Rebellion or Fridays for Future. And yeah, I really miss a neutral perspective on it. Maybe also because I write now my bachelor thesis on uh, civil disobedience and I was so scared that I said, wow, I always uh, thought it would be something very, um, like politics say it's something very dangerous, but at the end the definition is nothing dangerous. It's just a very, um, like people who really civilly want to, to show that there is something not going well. And if they get, um, 
if they get um, like they they, they want to use forces or something, it's not civil any disobedience anymore. In the discussion, in the philosophical debate, and in the in the historical debate, but journalists actually are still writing about it like this, and I don't understand why. It's really really scary, and I think we should I, I just stop. We just more push the idea that we are all activists than say, no, 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 with activism I don't have anything to do. No, if you want to change something, we have to get active. If we call it activism or not, why do we always have these this names that give us fears? I don't know, maybe you can explain it to me, but I was really lost two weeks ago when nothing was written there. Yeah, it's not that journalists are afraid, it's more like um, what they choose to write about and what not just reflects their view on what is relevant and what not. Okay. And it's even more sad, I guess, but um, that's just, yeah, that's the thing. We're not afraid of politicians or anything or whatever, it's just like, like this, and yeah, to be honest, like my a more personal stance from my side would also be to call for more activism and personal engagement and stuff like this. And the the point about like we don't have to be activists, um, I think it's valid still because we don't have to as scientists and journalists. Um, and it's also like the notion that uh, helps a lot of my colleagues to even get more active and more direct because. In science, as you said, and also in journalism, this is really a, a um, big difference and a big gap. And uh, you, you can't be activist because you can't just like lobby for one thing you think is important. So we do have different roles, but still everybody should get active. <laughs> Thank you very much. So we need to open this discussion very soon, otherwise we're running out of time. But if you want to have a half minute statement on scientists and activism, Natalie, Herr Eisenach, please go for it. You first? Please go. Okay, I'll try to be short, but I think <laughs> so what you're, what you're uh, with this question, you're challenging this truth speaks to power model. Scientists know and the decision makers get it and, may, and maybe journalists also produce the truth through recherche and then pr provide it to the uh, decision makers or they serve as a conveyor belt between scientists and policy makers, I would say, although there are still some colleagues that like this kind of model and maybe there are also some pockets in science where it makes sense, overall this is over. And here's also, we sp don't speak about new knowledge here. The, I, the early writings I know about this discourse about, uh, are from the 1970s that this is over and you can read uh, Max Weber, who already reflected this in a very well way more than 100 years ago. So this is, this is indeed not new. The question is how to, how to design this relation and what kind of modes we have. And then we are back to the different formats and different audiences. I think that's very difficult. We created the regional IPCC in France in different regions and we're discussing our social sciences with natural scienti scientists about commitment, engagement, activism even, and they're very afraid of it. So it means that if we want to stick together as an interdisciplinary, gr interdisciplinary group, we need to be very careful about how we engage in society. For myself, as a person, as a scientist, I am very much engaged because I think good research means engagement somehow and subjectivity and, you know, and bringing facts, but facts are always colored with values, so we need to acknowledge that. Thank you very much. So now you had plenty of time to think about your questions. Feel free to voice any concerns, comments, questions. There is a mic. Thank you so much for an interesting um, panel discussion so far. I um, wanted to ask, um, is it Nathalie Blanc? Okay, yes. Um, cause, um, so the starting point of the panel discussion and our summer, summer schools is, I think, 
that there is a gap between what we know of facts and statistics and what we are actually doing. And so um, I thought it was interesting that you mentioned there is perhaps a kind of knowledge that we are not um, sufficiently talking about, aesthetic knowledge. And I was hoping that you could elaborate on aesthetic knowledge of climate change and perhaps um, any examples of how climate change communication could appeal more, like if you have concrete examples of how climate change communication could appeal more to senses. Yes. Yeah, thank you for your question. I was working on this issue of aesthetic of climate change with this book, this collective book about that. I hope we're crossing these two issues. And I think that aesthetics are very important because it's a way we figure out our environment, how we can talk about it, collectively speaking. I mean, uh, am I talking about the earth? Am I talking, uh, uh, is it a round earth? Is it a square earth? Is it a world, uh, an earth deprived of human beings? And how do we represent it? Why do we choose to pick out a round earth as uh, something we should protect? All this issue of representation are very important, I think. And they're very more important today because with the threat that uh, climate issue bring to our existence, we need landmarks, as I, uh, as I said this morning. I mean, we don't know what kind of representation we need in order to be able to pursue our lives nowadays. Because climate issues, climate crises, uh, shatters all our landmarks, all our ways of seeing our lives in this world. For example, as I was telling uh, the students this morning, we can't talk anymore about the same climate zones. We used to talk temperate zone, uh, tropical zone and such. So, so, so everything is being shattered. So I think we could talk about vertigo. And vertigo is an aesthetic experience. I mean, it's a, a, a vertigo about facts and numbers. It's an existential vertigo. It's also a vertigo about the sheer size of what means a climate crisis. We're unable to grasp it, collectively speaking. It's part of the problem, in fact, that uh, we don't respond to it because it's just so huge that we don't have the way to represent it. And I think it's part of the aesthetic question in terms of climate issues. Anyone else? Hi. Uh, I have another question in terms of concise examples, uh, but this one for Sarah Schurman. And you said before that it's so important when you're talking with the public that you get across what you can do beyond the individual level, you know, like what you can do beyond, you know, getting the right apples at the supermarket. And um, as a science communi communicator myself, I made the experience that this is really not so easy to do because, um, well, not everybody, you know, has the time to really engage in you know, political work outside of their other jobs. And then often I would get the response of, you know, yeah, like I'm voting every four years and that's kind of what I do. Like, do you have like the, the, the what to do with the key? Did you, how do you have the key, the magic keys to have that conversation and to activate people? <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> um, I would say, um, Actually, I'm just working on a project where we are trying to set up some tool or website to make something like, okay, which is really important to you in life, and then we just explain what this has to do with the climate crisis, and then you can maybe deep dive into the facts, but if this is too scary for you, you can just go to, okay, and where are my levers? And um, they can be really, really different. So this is also kind of problem for the project now because this can be, okay, it's care work or it's sexism or racism and all this is really related to the climate crisis. And uh, if you're an expert on this, your um, possibilities to get engaged and show the connections might be very different than like when you're maybe my mom and she 
might say, okay, her garden is really important to her. And then you can also show how this is influenced by the climate crisis. And then um, what is the answer of what can she do? And when she says uh, her garden is really important to her, she uh, should go to the local community and uh, labor for... Um, a sustainable water management. She should um, force them to stop mowing the lawn because we really do need the biodiversity, stuff like this. And then you also have to have different um, offers like in how much time do you have? Because if you're a mom of three kids and working and stuff like this, you might not have the time to get that deeply engaged, but you might have the time to share some information in your mom WhatsApp groups and then go to a, a protest uh, once a month or something. And this also is really important. And what is really, really important is get connected to other people. Viru just said, so maybe you're just going to sit there and say, oh, okay, I don't know what to do. This is no problem at all because there are so many people who are already active and it's also such a good feeling to get connected to them because uh, most of them are actually pretty nice. This is a really good thing. I just realized being uh, in climate uh, stuff and um, and they they know the fields and you're not feeling alone and you can just like learn from them and even uh, if you do have so many new ideas, they will be so fucking thankful. So it's not like you will be reje rejected or something. So um, I think there are very, very different opportunities um, to get active and this is really not that easy in communicating because you have to know whom you're talking to. Right. But that's brilliant. Thank you. Do you is there a name for that website, for that project already? Yeah, we're just getting started. All right. Uh, so. Cool. Thanks. Uh, can I just add, um, add two ideas? Because I was thinking um, there is a research uh, done in Australia which um, t talks also about that you have um, address always the different audiences with different piece of information. So maybe, I don't know, I just know that Michael Schäfer from the Uni Zürich um, worked on that project as well. and. That's pretty interesting because, as you said, you are doing that to the people and they can choose, but it's also interesting how statistically, um, whether you, like, also whether you take the information from one source of information or not, also influences the, uh, the way you have, like, the, the type of information you need. Sometimes need this risky information that really gets you involved and emotionally touches. Other people just need facts brute facts. And so that's also important to see in science communication for whom you are, um, to whom you're talking and um, then decide which frame you give uh, to this thing. And then also that you were looking at me that's important to uh, get to others um, and at, at least I wanted to add also get together. Just. Um, it's just interesting if you talk with startup people and they say, yeah, we sit in a bar and then we develop this idea. Yeah, but first you have to talk about things. So just talk about climate change, talk about social uh, justice and stuff. And then you will get some idea, even if it is um, like also this text in a round, it's really underestimated. It can help so much if you like just petitions and you think, okay, I had a friend who always on Thursdays, I don't know, it was his day, um, he sat at home and uh, signed up to the national side of the petitions and read along all the new petitions and signed them. And I was like, yeah, it's that easy. He just took one hour every Thursday and this was his petition day. Why don't we do that? So I was never thinking about it, but at the end, yeah, it's, it's a great idea. So, um, so maybe also talking about that, um, communicating with each other, what are you doing? What are you doing? And not being guilty about it if you're not doing enough, just talk about it. I think that's already a very, very good start. So just a note, because I saw about four hands up just now. Is that right, Isabel? So I think just one, but there were others. There's one there, one there, and there was maybe one in the middle. So at least three people. So can I ask you for concise questions and concise answers, just because I have one eye trained on the clock and it's ticking. Thank you very much.
So we didn't have the mic, but it's about the role of the entertainment industries, if, they, if I got that right. Um, and I think that's a very pertinent question. What is their role in communication? Um, and that's something that Natalie and I have talked a bit about in relation to climate fiction, because we're both interested in literature. I don't know if anyone wants to respond to that. I think there is an issue of example. I was working with circus and people from the live performance sector, and they're wondering how to act, uh, and they want to engage this issue of climate change, but it means for them not to go on the road anymore, just not to be everywhere like they used to be, you know, even for great artists or great comedians or great dancers and stuff. So for example, Jérôme Bell, who is a very well-known choreographer in France, doesn't go anymore on, in uh, foreign countries. He just uh, work with people in Japan, for example, and he makes this choreography happen in other countries by talking to them uh, di in distance. So there are all kind of ways of engaging this issue, but it's very difficult for live performers too. I mean, it means many things in terms of, uh, of emission co carbon consumption. So, can you put up your hand again? I know you had a question. Yes, would you like to? A new mic is coming up. Thank you. Um, my question is about framing and creating a vision. So, because I know the situation is pretty grim right now, but what I'm often missing is the uh, message um, in the media and in science that we're actually not saving ourselves when we do something against climate change, but that we create a better world for everyone. So, what do you think? Why is this so rarely talked about, and what can we do to really show that? the life of everyone will get better and not be not just not allowed to fly anymore or stuff like that. Maybe I would uh, take this question. I was just talking in the workshop I was giving about this. Um, I really do think that as long as we're not facing how bad the situation is, all of this seems like an utopia. So um, I think that these are two parts of the same coin or something. In English, it's the other way around. But, um, so um, you have to first realize how bad the situation is to really imagine and think it's possible to change all this and to really have the good eff effects. Um, someone mentioned um, systems thinking, so multi-solving. It's also so important. And I think the last years, I did sometimes read stuff about this and was always like, oh yeah, nice, so someone's going to do this, I guess. And now I just know, okay, no, this is like really mind-blowing and it's really so nice and we, we can really dream of also better effects, better cities somehow, yeah, things are going to get complicated, but also we can win so much and we can uh, save so much. But this, um, yeah, you have to get transported, that's not just a dream. So on my list, I have two more questions at the moment. The gentleman here. No, no, we still have five to ten minutes, and then Sue. Can you hear me? Yeah. No. We have a stream. Oh, yeah, of course. <laughs> Anyway, I think you're going to like this question because it's a yes or no question. Um, but I wanted to know, um, like, we've also had other uh, Circle U uh, sh um, programs, one in health and one in democracy, uh, two subjects that are also uh, arguably in crisis. I mean, we all still have, like, a, a mask in our pockets, and I think it's very arguable that democracy certainly is in crisis. You could also say that we're having a crisis in, in, on the border of Europe and Ukraine right now. Um, and obviously we all care about climate since we're here, but given that people have at least four uh, crises to worry about right now, um, and they also have lives of their own personal uh, crises to care about, is it fair to expect people on, uh, as individuals to combat climate change when they also combat uh, other things in their lives? Maybe I will just jump in here. Um 
interesting thing is that all these crises belong together because like uh, we're not only facing the climate crisis but also the biodiversity loss and some other planetary crisis that we rarely mention and um, the reason why we're having this mask is because of the biodiversity crisis um, and um, so health and climate and all our planetary crises are really really closely interlinked this war is really really closely interlinked to um, climate crisis and gas consumption and oil and stuff like this and um, the democracy um, will be very much under pressure um, when we are facing all the consequences we will see in the climate crisis. So I think we should also there, maybe in the summer schools, just like look where are the interconnections and where are the levers to really change things, maybe. Thank you very much. Would you like to, no. There was one more part of the question, like is it fair for individuals to, maybe you want to answer? Um, yeah, maybe this was the part that I was uh, more focusing on, because I think it's not possible to not do it anymore. Like, we, like, I think now maybe we can think, talk about preparing someone, but there will be the stages, as the summer we saw, we, we have to act and we nobody knows how and we are all like scared wow this can happen in germany and no we knew that this can happen in germany but why aren't we prepared so i think we have to get prepared also on a psychological way that we know okay um maybe we as a, as an individual do not have to find the solutions for everything of course i i would not say that that is necessary but that you on your own are um, aware that you have to be open to the change and that if we have to uh, use less oil and gas then we have to do it and there is no way out and like in when there were war times nobody asked about it so okay they complained maybe of people like historians um tell that the people had like there was no other option now we're still like hoping but hope is is very a privilege i think like we have to be realistic if if there is not another oil we have to use less and we have to accept that and i think that is one of the most steps that an individual can also to accept a decision when we have to do some not to do something because of climate policies who so you're next Thank you very much. Um, thank you for a wonderful discussion. Um, I've had um, the little bit of discussion you started on about objectivity and uh, um, emotion and, and those things going around in my mind. And it's made me think about um, how academics present their role, the role of their research to society and also to think about what we're trying to do through our teaching, um, the kind of um, things we're trying to enable our students to be able to do whilst at university and in their future roles in, in society. And I'm speaking as an anthropologist, and until the 1970s, anthropology dressed itself in a cloak of scientism. They believed that um, uh, to be a, a respectable science, you had to look as if you were a physicist. And to look like a physicist, you had to pretend that there was something called objectivity. Although there was something called the, the science of observables, I think, which kind of undermined that in physics itself. Um, and so the, it had to, there was a kind of scientism that spread through the discipline. And in the 1970s, and of course this is to do with the third wave of feminism, um, there were a lot of anthropologists who, who began to think about the fact that, no, we're not objective, we're positioned within society, and we are, as researchers, we are the main tool of our own research through that positionality in society, and we're studying everybody else who's also positioned in society. And that, therefore, research is often motivated 
by the things that we take seriously. And I think that science is also often motivated by the things that scientists take seriously. But there was one particular anthropologist, Laura Nader, who came out with a wonderful statement that being motivated by indignation is perfectly acceptable. Um, I think we've got to beyond indignation. We're now we've got fear and anger. Um, and I think we have to find a way of conveying our research in a way that doesn't look, on the one hand, as if it's anecdotal positionality, but on the other hand, shows that how it's justifiable, rigorous research that is motivated by personal commitment. And that kind of engagement needs to come through in the way that we talk publicly. And I don't think we've found the style of communication that enables us to do that yet. And from what you're saying, I don't think journalists have either. So that's one side of what I'm thinking about. And the other thing I'm thinking about is, so this student activism thing that you've been talking about and how it frightens everybody, some people. Um, since the 1990s, I don't know about Germany, but certainly in Britain and Denmark, where I've lived, universities have been subject to a torrent of re demands, really, that we turn ourselves into neoliberal organizations and we turn teaching into a form of creating neoliberal subjects. I mean, I'm using sh shorthand here. Um, but that they won't only act in ways that uh, act as consumers and try and get good marks and uh, try and get through a system to come out the other end, but they will take that way of thinking into their world of work and into the world that they create around themselves in the rest of their lives. And we have to think that that has to come to an end now. And so the question is then, what kind of education do we want to be providing for our students? Or what do we need to enable them to be able to provide for themselves? And my kind of fumbling towards an answer to that question is that we have to generate critical thinkers who can use their knowledge and their research skills to turn that into action for change in the university and in the world. And again, this summer school has been brilliant in showing the way to do that, but I still think we've got a lot of thinking about how we do that. Thank you. I think that was excellently said. <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, with the um, terms of uh, objectivity, that there is no objective truth, I think that is one point I want to comment on because that's where we stopped before in the discussion. Because if you say scientists and journalists are always positioned, so then the question is so what? That is not an arbitrary thing we are doing here. And I think what what uh, universities, but also other places, need to convey is that scientific work, and I also would say journalistic work, has high standards. And these are standards that are different from standards in other parts of society. And that also needs to be conveyed. When there's criticism about journalists, and no one talks about what the journalistic standards are in the media, people are not informed about this and they forget about those standards or they have maybe have never learned about this and this is the same to science. So what does it mean to have good science? What does it mean to have a sharp, good argument that can be well justified? I think this is always of a help and that is more important than the neoliberal indicator systems for measuring success of teaching. Yeah? <laughs> Thanks. Thank you very much. So if there are no more burning comments or questions, I think we'll take this little interchange as a closing remark, and I think it's a good one. Thank you very much for that. Um, I'm sure we could talk on forever, or at least until midnight, but it's very warm in here, and you've had a long day, all of you, you too. So I want to thank you very much for this really very engaging panel and for sharing all this with us, and I want to thank you for listening and for asking really interesting and really important questions. Take care. Bye-bye.